Trust me with your, with your forgiveness. Yeah, yeah. Every now and again, I like to take some of my Tuesday stuff and put it on uh, Friday, put it online for Friday. This week, we're talking about pastors. We've been talking about bad pastors since last September. We dealt with pastors' role and what pastors are supposed to be doing. And now I want to talk about some of the things that pastors are supposed to be doing. I want to give you some insight on what God's plans for you concerning your pastor. So I'm not sure that everybody really gets a good understanding of the real God of the Bible. Remember the time when God told Moses, hey Moses, speak to a rock in the sight of the people and it'll produce water for them to drink and it'll produce water for them to, to feed their flocks. Moses said, okay, he got all the congregation together and said to them, listen up, you rebels. Must we fetch water out of these rocks for you too? The Bible says Moses lifted up his hand with his rod and he hit the rock twice. The water came out. The, the Bible is, is clear that God doesn't want you treating his people any kind of way. A few chapters later, you see God calling Moses and say, Hey Moses, come up here in this mountain and look, and you'll see the promised land that I promised you. This is the promised land that I promised you you'll have when you leave Egypt. This is what I promised you will happen when, you, when I destroy Pharaoh. When you go through the water, when you come over to the other side, I'm going to take you into this promised land. And guess what? When you see it, you're going to drop dead. Just like your brother Aaron dropped there. I'm, I'm fully convinced that God doesn't play when it comes to his people. You're not allowed to treat God's people any kind of way. You're not allowed to disobey God's commandments, even a little bit. God spoke clearly. He told him to speak to the rock. He never told him to hit the rock. He never told him to insult his people. You're not allowed to do or say whatever it is that you want to say or do whatever it is that you want to do. Moses goes to God with a request. He said, okay, God, since I'm going to look, can't resist looking over there. I want to see the promise, man. I know what's going to happen. You just told me. If I look, curiosity is going to get the best of me. If I look, I know what's going to happen. Can you please set a man over your people? See, see, Moses is a real man of God. It's the same people that got him upset. It's the same people that got him, that he got an attitude because of him. It's the same people that got him in trouble. But look at his heart. He has a heart because he wants, he still wants those same people that got him in trouble. He wants them to have a leader. He asks God for a man, whoever you choose, to lead your people so that none of them will be like a sheep without a shepherd. In verse 18, you see God honoring his request. He told him, okay, get Joshua, a man that has the spirit. What spirit? I hope your pastor is full of the Holy Ghost. I hope your pastor is full of the spirit of God so that God can feed you with knowledge and understanding of his word. In this final hour, before the Lord returns, you need a pastor that understands prophecy that understands what's going to happen, the signs of the time. You need a pastor that's full of the spirit so he can lead you and guide you into the promised land. Jeremiah prophesied that there will be pastors, even when we get to New Jerusalem. In chapter three, verse 14, it says, turn old backsliding children, said the Lord, because I'm married to you and I will take one of the city. There will be some cities where there's only one person that God's gonna take out of this city. There will be some families where there's only two people God is going to take out of their family. Then God's going to take you and he's going to bring you to New Jerusalem. Then it says in verse 15, and I will give you pastors according to my heart, which will feed you with knowledge and understanding. That's the express purpose of a pastor. That's the critical reason for you having a pastor. God has it set up already so that the knowledge and the understanding that you need this same knowledge and understanding was represented as the water. This knowledge and understanding, you must get it from your pastor. Fast forward to when Jesus is on the scene, Jesus is out healing, he's out preaching in the synagogues. Jesus saw, he saw the crowd of people and he felt sorry for them. He, he, felt, he felt sorry for them because, because they were troubled. They were abandoned, they were, they were worn out, they were dispirited, they were helpless. They weren't all together. They were just the same way it would be if a, a flock of sheep didn't have a leader. So God said, okay, before he left earth to go prepare New Jerusalem, he told Peter, hey, Peter, I got a question for you. Do you love me? 
Peter answered, yeah, yeah, I love you. Ask him again, Peter, do you love me? Now Peter's getting uncomfortable. Yeah, oh, yeah, I, I love you, right? I mean, this is two men talking. And, and Peter says, I love you. God asked him one more time. This is when Peter almost got upset. Peter said, God, you know all things. You know I love you. Does God know you love him? Jesus said, after the third time asking him, Peter, do you love me? The very next thing he says, after asking him, do you love me? He said, feed my sheep. Just like he chose Joshua to do. This is the same thing he chose Joshua to do, to lead his people. It's here you see him doing the same thing he did with Moses. He put a shepherd over his flock. In 1 Timothy 5, 18, we're going to find out a little bit more about the purpose of a pastor, the purpose of God sending a pastor. Because you have to probably figure out, why doesn't God just speak directly to people? Why does he have a, a medium, an intern, uh, somebody in the middle? Why does he pick somebody to talk, talk to to talk to you? Why doesn't God just talk directly to us? Why doesn't God just talk directly to his people? We can see already the pattern that God has set up that he's not doing that. People get weird. Sometimes you hear people saying, oh, God told me to roll the window down because I need some fresh air. Oh, God told me to eat some fruit today instead of vegetables today. And people get really loopy with it. But that's not God's setup. That's not God's standard. God sets up a pastor according to his heart that he's going to give you. And that pastor is going to get knowledge and information directly from God and give that information to you. That's why it's extremely important if you have a pastor that you need to look at that pastor as God's mouthpiece. You need to look at that pastor as God is speaking to you whenever that pastor is up speaking. And you need to pray that God will use that pastor, that pa the pastor won't have his mind on other things, that his, his spirit won't be on other things, that he'd be ready to hear from God and deliver his message without any type of uh, distractions. And you need to make sure that when you're talking to God and when you're talking to him, you're talking to him specifically and directly because when God responds to you, he's going to respond to you in the song that the pastor picks. He's going to respond to you in the message that the pastor says. You might be listening to a whole message and then one thing that he says, you wonder, was that really God talking to me? That's how he talks to you. He's going to use the pastor for that purpose. The pastor is extremely important. Verse 18 in 1 Timothy verse 5 says, For the scripture said, Thou shall not muzzle the ox that treadeth out the corn, and the laborer is worthy of his reward. A lot of pastors will use this to say that this is the reason why you should pay the pastor. Pastors should be be uh, driving around in their nice Cadillac, the Mercedes Benz that have lucrative uh, lifestyles, and, uh, shiny watches, and give me a nice suit with gaiters. This is what pastors want. This is scripture pastors use. But let's go to verse 17. This is the uh, scripture that pastors use to get you to do what they want to make them have a better lifestyle. Verse 17 says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. Where is the money in there? Especially they who labor in the word and in doctrine. Okay. For the scripture said, thou shalt not muzzle the ox. I don't see money here, but I see double honor. I see expecting their pastor to be God's mouthpiece. And we're going to honor him so that we can get a word from God because we can't live without it. Let's go to Jude one twenty four. You can take any scripture in the Bible, twist it up and mess it all up. But God has a standard and God is going to get every pastor that's not doing exactly what he called him to do. Jude 1, 24. So God is he expecting us to be perfect, not perfect. And you never made a mistake, but perfect. And if I make a mistake, I know what to do. I know how to fix it. I know how to repent. I know how to acknowledge my mistakes. I know how to say I'm sorry. I know how to get it right. I know how to not to just walk over my mistakes and pretend like it didn't happen. I know how to go to God and say, I messed up. What can I do for you, God, to prove to you that I'm not going to do that ever again? God needs to hear you say that. God needs to heal, feel your spirit when you tell him, I'm never going to do that or any sin again. God needs to feel you when you say that. Verse 24 of June chapter one says, now unto him, who is him? God, that is able, God is able to keep you from sinning from falling and from backsliding. God has the power to do that. And he says before the to and to present you faultless. God wants to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. How is he going to do that? What is the method that he's going to use to get you perfect, faultless, and to keep you from falling? How are you going to do that? He's going to do that through your pastor. He's going to do that by feeding you with knowledge and understanding. That's how you're going to get perfect. Let's go to Ephesians 4.11. God has a whole setup 
a whole standard. He has a, you can't come around God. You can't come through another gate. You can't come through another door. You have to do it just the way God has it set up. You have no options in this. This is not, this is, this is not a, um, a democracy. God has it set up the way he has it set up for a reason. In verse 11, he says, and he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Does that mean he gave some prophets as plural prophets or does he that mean he gave some people prophets or some people evangelists? I don't know. Verse 12 says, what is the purpose of them? Pastors and teachers and prophets and evangelists for the perfecting of the saints, because we just read before that in Jude that this is what God wants. He wants us to be faultless. How are you going to do that? By the pastors perfecting I mean, for the pastors preaching and teaching, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the purpose. That's why God gives you a leader. God gives you a leader based on what you need. God gives you a leader based on what's inside of you. And God gives that leader within his heart throughout his entire life, everything that he's gone through, everything that he's read, everything that he's studied, everything that he's he's had to deal with, every trauma, every bad thing that ever happened to him, all of that was put on him and done to him so that he can be a mouthpiece to you, for you, to perfect you and to present you faultless. Let's go to 2 Ezra 14, 6. You might have to type that in the search. 2 Ezra, E-S-D-R-A-S, 2 Ezra chapter 14, verse 6. This um, Second Ezra is part of the um, 1611 King James authorized Bible. King James authorized 80 books. If you have a Bible that does not have 80 books, you do not have the authorized King James Bible. Second Ezra 14 verse 6 says, These words shalt thou declare. Who's talking here? God is talking to Moses, and he's giving Moses during when Moses was up in the mountains for 40 days, I think he was there. God told Moses a whole heap of things, a month and a half. Of God just giving, feeding the, feeding the, um, Moses, feeding him. Why did God talk to Moses like that? Because the people says we don't trust Moses. Moses could be telling us a whole bunch of stuff. We want to hear from you, God. God said, "Oh, you want to hear from me?" God came down and he started talking to them, and lightning, and thunder, and wind, and it was so bad that the, the people begged God to stop talking. We can't take it. We don't want you talking directly to us. We can't handle it. Talk to Moses. We'll listen to him. And that's why God has it set up that way. So God gives Moses what he wants to give to the people. And God says in verse six, these words shall you declare. These words you can say. So I want you to say this stuff. I give you a bunch of stuff. This stuff I want you to say. And these words in the second clause there says these hide. Why would God give Moses words? Why would God give Moses instructions? Why would God give Moses scriptures, commandments and tell him to hide them? Hide them from who? And who can reveal them? Moses is gone. You see where I'm going? Why did God tell Moses to hide words? Verse 5 says, and told him many wondrous things, right? God told Moses a bunch of things that you can't even understand or he can't even pronounce. Showed him the secrets of the times. That means God told Moses, this is when I'm coming back. This is what you look for. This is what's going to happen. He also told, showed him the end. He showed him the end. He showed him this is the last moment. When this happens, this is when I'm coming back immediately. God showed him that, but then he told him right away, these declare, these hide. What, is he show, what did he show him in the beginning and the end? He showed him the wheat and the tear. He showed him Cain and Abel. He showed him Esau and Jacob. Let's uh, go to Genesis verse 25, verse 23. And we're going to find out what's at the end that happened in the beginning. He told him in the beginning what's going to happen in the end. Genesis 25, verse 23. We'll see exactly what God is talking about when he says, I showed you some things to hide and some things to declare. There's a, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible that's hidden. And your pastor has that information. God put that within him. And God revealed that to, to him. And God charges him to get that stuff that he put inside of you, that's hidden inside of you, he wants you to declare that out at the perfect time to make you perfect, to make you faultless. Verse 23 says, and the Lord said unto her, who's the her? Is it Leah? 
No, it was Rebecca. He told Rebecca, you got two nations in your womb. You have two different kinds of people. They're going to be separated from your body. One of the people, this is plural. We're talking about Esau and we're uh, talking about Jacob. These are two people. God is talking about a nation of people. He's not talking about the two people that's inside of you. He's already seen the end time. He's already sees, he's in the beginning and you see two babies, but God is saying, I'm showing you two different kinds of people and I'm showing you two nations of people and notice people is plural. And one people shall be stronger than the other people. And the elder, the child that comes out first, is going to serve the younger. Did that happen yet? That's going to happen. This is the beginning. Genesis, God is telling Moses in the beginning, who wrote this? Moses. He told him in the beginning, something's going to happen. The first kid that's come out, he's going to serve the second kid. The first nation that comes out is going to serve the second nation. The first people that comes out is going to serve the second people that came out. Job 9.24. This is the end. God is telling you what's going to happen in the end. And God gives this information to a pastor so that he can reveal it to you on your level so that you can comprehend it, you can understand it, and so you can be fathers. In Job chapter 9, verse 24, God gives us this intelligence. He says, the earth is given into the hand of the wicked. That's current. Who is in? Who is this person? Who is these people that God is acknowledging is wicked? Who's in charge of the earth? Now, because we know what's going to happen in the end. All right. He covered the faces of the judges thereof. If it's not the person I'm telling you, then who is it? Who is these people that he's talking about? Let's go to Amos 3, 7. This is real Bible class. Do Bible class. We run through scriptures. We match them up. We add them up. We don't just call one scripture and give you my philosophy. I don't have a philosophy to give you. I have Bible. Amos 3, 7 says, Surely the Lord God will do nothing. This is God Almighty saying, I ain't going to do nothing unless I tell it to my servants, to my prophets. God tells his servants. God tells his prophets. God tells his preachers. God tells his evangelists and his teachers what he's going to do. He lets your pastor know what's going to happen. Your pastor is a lot more important than you think. Your pastor is a lot more valuable than you think. If you don't have a pastor, we'd love to have you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9. God is letting all of his people know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm not silent. I am the Logos. I love to talk. I love to explain. I love to tell you what I'm going to do. But I have a system set up where I tell your pastor. This is why you need a pastor. Where am I at? 1 Corinthians 2 9. All right, we're going to read 1 Corinthians 2 9, and then we're going to read 1 Corinthians 2 10. I know you guys are used to having the slides with the scriptures already on there, but it is written, I haven't seen nor ear heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for them that love him. So God is telling you, there's some stuff that I got for you, the way the, the world is going to be. The way that, 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 that heaven is going to be when God returns, the way the kingdom is going to be when God returns, it's so awesome, it can't even enter into your heart. But God tells your pastor so that he can tell you, so that he can encourage you. And your pastor might not give you everything he at, at once. He might not give you everything at all. But if your pastor tells you, there's some good things. You need to get saved. You need to stop smoking. You need to stop drinking. You need to stop cussing. You need to stop listening to that word of music. You need to dress modest. You need to come to church. You need to give God your life. You need to surrender. You need to get baptized. You need to give the Holy Ghost. When the pastor tells you that stuff, it's because he sees. God has showed him these things and he put it in his heart. Verse 10 says, but God has revealed them unto us by his spirit. But I thought it just said, eyes haven't seen and ears haven't heard. Well, who he revealed them to? Well, the verse before that says, God will do nothing unless he tells his servants. For the Spirit searches all things, yet the deep things of God. Let's go to John 12, verse 48. This would be St. John, chapter 12, and verse 48. And then we're going to run to Ezekiel. So we have St. John, chapter 12, verse 48. It says, He that rejected me and received not my words, the person that doesn't receive the words of the Lord, the person that rejects God, the person that doesn't receive the words that the pastor speaks, the person that doesn't receive the word of God 
hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. Here he is again, telling you what's going to happen. The words that God speak through the pastor is extremely important. You're going to be judged by those words. Let's go to Ezekiel 3.17. And he's talking to the pastors here. And he's saying, son of man, I have made thee a watchman, a shepherd, a pastor, to watch out. Watch out for God's people. I have made you a watchman unto the house of Israel. Or everybody. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. Why doesn't God warn people directly? If God is, if, if you are doing something and God is so gracious and so merciful that he's going to warn you, that's nice because he can just destroy you. He can just wipe you out. But instead, he's going to warn you. Why doesn't he warn you directly? Because that's not how God sets things up. He says right here, he's going to tell the watchman to warn you. Let's go to 33.6, same, uh, Ezekiel 33.6. God has a setup. He has a system. We have to become a part of his system. We can't change his system and we might not even be able to understand it, but we have to believe it and accept it. God is going to send a leader to warn you and you need to listen to his words. Verse 36, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 33. But if the watchmen see the sword coming, so how's he going to see the sword, the sword coming? Because God gives him those things. God shows him those things. And blow not the trumpet. That means he doesn't make a big enough noise and do everything he can to warn you and let you know through the word of God that something's going to happen. And the people be not warned. So if you don't warn the people, I don't care if they don't like it. I don't care about the looks that they give you. I don't care about the attitude that they have. God has given you those people under your shepherd, under your tutelage to teach them and to warn them. If you don't do it, if the sword comes and take any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity. That means he, if he, you don't warn him about his sins, he's going to die in his sins. But the blood of that person, you're going to pay for it. The pastor is in trouble if he doesn't warn you about your sins. The pastor is in trouble if he sees danger and don't warn you. If the pastor tells you it's time to fast, it's a reason for that. And if he doesn't tell you that, he's in trouble for it. If the pastor tells you there's too much flesh around you, too much worldliness, we've got to change some things up, and you don't adjust, that's fine. That's on you. You're going to be taken away in your iniquity, just like it says here. But if he doesn't say it, if he says, no, the people are not going to like it. If he says, no, people are going to leave. No, people are going to be mad at me. No, that's a mean message. No, that's a sad message. No, I'd rather preach something else. Man, I want to talk about loveliness, gumdrops, and, and waterfalls, and wonderful things. If he does that... But his blood will I require at the watchman's hand. So son of man, verse seven. So thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Where? Therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. God is not coming to warn you. God is not going to give you a dream in the middle of the night. God is not going to talk to you. He's going to talk to your pastor. Poor pastor. The pastor has to, he, the pastor can go to hell if he doesn't warn you. The pastor can be in trouble for not warning you. The poor pastor, he has so much to do. When I wake up tomorrow morning, the pastor, my pastor better have my meat on the grill. I want to give you an analogy. I want to show you how the pastor job or his role is in our minds and how we need to make a quick and immediate judgment on how we're going to deal with God's mouthpiece. I want my meat on the grill. How's it going to get there? Pastor got to do it. Pastor got to clean it. And he got to season it. He got to go to the store first. He got to get the money first. So you got to have a job, get the money, go to the store, walk the store, buy the meat, carry the meat come. Season it, clean it, put it on the grill. Pastor cooked good meat. He cooks good food. You get man, I'm gonna tell everybody about that. You got to come try pastor's food. I can't even wait. Oh, he's done? Well, I need him to make me a plate. And then I need him to make me a plate with the portions that I want, with the portions I can handle. Don't give me too much. Don't give me too less because I don't want to have to get up and get some more. Give me just the amount of meat I want. And don't put stuff on there that I don't eat. Don't put stuff on that plate that I don't like. You see how this goes? That's what we want from the pastor. And we're going to sit back 
and the pastor better figure out how I like it, and the pastor better figure out how much barbecue sauce to put on there. And when he's done, we're going to watch the pastor go clean the grill. He got to go clean because you got to do this next time. Pastor got to come back next week. Next Friday at 7 p.m., pastor got to come back. And pastor better have the grill clean because I need to eat. Didn't Bible says that that's what the pastor is supposed to be doing? Feeding you? All right, if the pastor, I want you to switch that from natural, from carnal to spiritual. Let's put that spiritual. The pastor has to get the message. The pastor has to deal with the message. The pastor has to pray about it. The pastor has to fast on it. The pastor has to ask questions. The pastor has to talk to God about it. The pastor has to push away things that he would rather do. The pastor has to push away fun that he want to have because the pastor has to get deep into the word because he have to feed the people. If not, your blood is going to be required of him. I'm going to get in trouble if I don't get this right. If I don't get these words right, if I say the wrong thing, if I don't say enough, I got to get this right. While you do what? The pastor got to get it right. The pastor got to give it to the way that you like it. You don't like him to talk to you like that. You don't want that song that he's saying. You don't want those words that he used. You don't want pastor to be too harsh. Give me my plate just the way I want it. And when you're done, whoo, pastor breathes good. That's good. Thank you. That was nice. I enjoyed it. Bye. You clean up. You deal with the emotional effect of that. You deal with the worry and the pain and struggling and trying to figure out, did I say everything that I'm supposed to say? Did I forget to say, oh my God, I forgot to say something. What about the scripture I forgot to say? I should have written it down. Oh no, oh no, oh no, God's going to get me. Should I call everybody back? Should I just add it to the next message? What should I do? Because I wish somebody would pray for me at the end of this service because I don't know if I fulfilled my goal here. I don't know if I fulfilled my job, my purpose. But what about the people's purpose? The pastor's, his purpose is lined up and it's set up and you got it. What is yours? Are you going to go to the store one day? Are you going to at least start the grill? He has to do all of it and get in trouble if you don't receive it or if you don't like it. First Corinthians 9, 11. What happens if you aren't a part of the pastor warning the people? Are you a part of what judgment is going to come upon the pastor as well? What if you could have? What if you could have helped the pastor deliver that message? What if you was a part of that? If the pastor has 20 scriptures and you were able to help him with five, you helped the pastor warn the people and you helped the people. There's people saved and your pastor is saved. Win-win. 1 Corinthians 9.11 says what? 1 Corinthians 9.11. If we have sown unto you spiritual things, who? Pastors. The pastor has given you spiritual things. Is it a great thing if we shall reap your carnal things. So here we're going back to where it says, don't muzzle out the ox that treaded the corn. What does that mean? You have an ox and he has the big uh, yoke around his necks and the ox or the cow, he's carrying the big something behind him and he's pulling up all the corn. The Bible says, don't cover his mouth. If he want to eat some corn while he's doing the work, let him eat some corn, have some respect. Would you go starve him? If you let him eat, he'll enjoy doing it. Get it? If he, if you are nice to the to the ox, if you're generous to the ox, he won't get so tired so quick and get so hungry. What kind of work do you think he's going to get when he's starving and you have a muzzle on his mouth and won't let him eat some of the corn? So 1 Corinthians 9, 11 says, basically, if I'm giving you spiritual things, do you think I want natural things? If a pastor is preaching the word of God, do you think I want money? You think I want gifts? What does the pastor want? Let's go down, let's skip down just for time to verse 18. And then we're going to skip down to 20. What is my reward then? Paul is asking. Well, what do I want? What do I get? Because I know what punishment I get if I don't get this right, if I don't do this right, if I don't say the right thing. I know what my punishment is. But why am I doing this? What do I get out of this? Verse 18 says, what is my reward then? Ver verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge without charge, without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. When you do this for money, when you do this for other reasons, when you do this for filthy lucker, when you do this for, for money and planes and all type of foolishness, when you do that, you know what happens? You're abusing your power. Verse 20, let's skip down to verse 20 just for time. And unto the Jews, all right, let's do 19. For, that, for though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more and unto the Jews I became a Jew so I'm I, I I spoke the language that they spoke I adjusted my culture 
did what I had to do. I didn't change the word of God. I didn't take back. I didn't shortcut. I just uh, uh, adjusted so that I can reach these, this group of people. To them that are that I might gain the Jews. He asked the question, what's my reward? He just told you that I might gain the Jews. Look, look at what a pastor wants. To gain souls. That's the pastor's reward. That's all I want. Let's keep going. As under the law that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 21. To them that which are without the law as without them. To them that are without law as without law. Being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that don't know the word of God. He's telling you here what his payment is. He wants to bring God a worshiper. He wants to see people saved. Verse 22. To the weak became I weak that I might gain the weak. His goal is to gain the weak. I made, I am made all things to all men that I might by all men's. If I just get a couple, if I can save two people, if I can save 30 people, that's all the pastor wants. That's your payment. That's your reward, not money, not anything else. When you do, when you help your pastor, when you go out for your pastor, when you help the pastor carry the groceries in, when you help the pastor get that word ready, for the people, you're helping the pastor get his reward. His reward is winning those souls. And when he gets to stand before the Lord, his reward then is for the souls. He gets a crown for that. Where are we at? 22, 922. All right, let's go to 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partakers thereof with you. So I do this. The pastor does this so that when you are saved, when you get to heaven, I can be there with you. So that I didn't, I didn't do this out of out of anger or anything else. Let's go to verse 27. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 27. But I keep under my body and bring it under subjection. You have to force yourself to stay in the word. You have to force yourself to not to go hang with your friend. Or you have to force yourself not to live carnally. You have to force yourself to pray to stay prayerfully. You have to force yourself. To block out all of the things that's bothering your mind, all of the anxiety, all of the depression. You have to fight against it so that you have to get your body under subjection so you can do this work for the Lord. You don't have time for anything else. And it's sad if a pastor doesn't have that help, if he doesn't have that people that backing him up. Lest that by any means what I have preached to others. He's saying, I don't want to preach to everybody and they get saved and I be cut off. I be cast away. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 4.10. Because that can happen. The pastor can get lost because when the pastor has a message that God gave him, that's when he gets to the biggest attack of his life. Because the, the enemy doesn't want him to deliver that message. Of course not. So that, the, that you have 10 people in your congregation, for example, and you have a message that's tailor-made for five of them. And the, the enemy doesn't want those five people to get that message. Does he attack them or does he attack the pastor? Five times. The poor pastor has to deal with the attack five times. They're going to attack him on his job. They're going to attack his mind. Every time he gets ready to get up, he has all of this pressure on him and he doesn't know where it's coming from because you need a pastor. And the poor guy, we kill pastors. Pastors die early. Pastors preach and drop dead in the pulpit. That happens because the pastor is there and he won't, he won't stop because he know I have to do this. The message God gave me last night, I have to say it. I have to give it to you, your culture with as much force and as much power as I can. So when I'm done, I don't have any regrets. All pastors live with regrets. All preachers live with regrets. The moment he leaves the pulpit and say, amen, praise the Lord, his mind starts, you messed up. You shouldn't have said it like that. You shouldn't have did this. So I'm going to do it next time with all I got. Give it everything I got. I'm not going to leave any scriptures out this time. And when he's done, it starts all over again. That's what happens afterwards. What happens before? What happened to two days before, three days before, when the poor guy is preparing the message? When he's getting his mind and getting the scriptures together, he has to deal with all of the demons that you have to deal with, plus his own, plus the other three, uh, the four members. Poor guy. Where are we at? First Corinthians 4.10. We are fools for Christ's sake. And this is our last one. I think. Yes. We are fools for Christ's sake. But we are wise in Christ. We are weak. I'm sorry. Let me read this again. We. Who's the we here? The preachers, the pastors, we are fools for Christ's sake. So he's humbling himself and letting you know, hey, I don't know anything. I'm just doing the work, the Lord's work. 
There's been many times when pastors will get up and preach a message or study a message and have no idea how I came up with that. There's a lot of times where I go back and watch my videos. I, I cannot remember saying that. I said that. There's been many times where I'm at work and I re-listen to my message and I get a message out of that. I don't remember saying it. Verse uh, 10, we are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise. You see that? I'm doing this so that you can be wise. We are weak, but my message is making you strong in the faith. It's getting you there, but it's making me weak as I do that. You are honorable, but everybody hates me. Everybody hates the preacher. Everybody, oh God, here we go. Another Friday, seven o'clock. We got to listen to him. But you're honorable. You got it great. God is going to bless you because if you accept the word if and you need to learn to do two things. I need everybody to learn to do two things. Get up every morning and talk to God with the expectation of God talking back to you. Don't just ramble off a bunch of things that you want. God, do this. Give me this. Give me this. Talk to God. God, how do you want me to act today? How do you want me to respond? How do you want me to live today? How fast do you want me to walk? Do you want, What do you want from me? What's inside of my heart? What's inside of my mind? What's inside of my body that's not right? What are the things that I do that you can't stand to see me do? Please talk to me. Please tell me. Now, how badly do you want to hear God respond to that? Who wants to know what's inside of you that God does not like? I want to know. Tell me all the stuff that's inside of me that's not like you. That's not just like you. What are the things that I do? Why do I have these thoughts, God? Talk to me about that. Because with those things inside of me, I can never be saved. I can never be saved with a black heart, with a wicked mind, with the, 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 with the proclivities that I can't control. I can't stop lying. I can't stop calling him. I can't stop going on this, these websites. I can't be saved like that. I need help, God. I know these things are not like you, but what else? What else is in me? Because I'm humbling myself knowing that I can't figure out everything that's wrong with me. And I'm not even ever going to admit that I don't have, I'm, not, I'm humble enough to admit that those things are wrong. So I need you to talk to me about that. And when does he do that? He does that with your pastor. When you're praying to him, God is downloading into the pastor. If you have a problem with lust, God is preparing a lust message for your pastor. If you're sincerely praying for that and he's giving him that. And guess what's going to happen? Guess what a lust demon is going to be directed now? Right at the pastor. Now he has to deal with that. Do you want a lust filled message coming from your pastor? Do you want a lustful pastor, for example? Or do you want to challenge yourself to pray for the pastor too? Lord, bless the pastor. Let him pick me up in the spirit. When I'm in the shower praying, God, tonight, tomorrow, Sunday, talk to my pastor. Block all the spirits that's coming against him. Give him a clear mind. Help him. If you see the poor man got his, his uh, collar sticking up. I remember the pastor preached one day with his collar sticking up. That's all I saw. I just looked right at the collar all day, just hoping it'd fall down. Help him, God. Somebody go help the poor guy out. Go up there in the pulpit, fix his collar and straighten him out so he's not a distraction to somebody else so that they can get the word so that lust demon can be destroyed. And when your pastor gets up, look for him to say something. It might not be about what you pre uh, prayed about today. You might have prayed about lust today. But last year, last month, you prayed about gluttony. You prayed about your lying spirit. You prayed about your pride. The pastor is about to deliver that message now. What you have to do, that's the second thing. The second thing that you have to do is you have to, while he's preaching, you're praying and you're asking God, talk directly to me. Use him. Talk specifically and directly to me. And whatever he says, you have to accept. That's God talking to me directly. Forget about him. Forget about his person. But look for the Holy Ghost inside of him. When he says, you need to worship more. That's the, the message from God about your lust. That's the, the solution. That's the remedy. That's the prescription for your proclivities that you have. It's right there. You can't just go on. You can't just ignore it. And you can't just think it's for somebody else. That's for me. I need to worship more. When the pastor's going through and he's talking about his message, whatever he says is for me. And you need to make an adjustment immediately. This is how the old church operated. The pastor gets up and he's preaching about modesty. And he's talking about some of the ladies who have these big long fingernails and these big bright color fingernails. Right then within themselves, these women start cutting their fingernails right in church. Silly, it's unnecessary, it's whatever. It's just an example. You need to do the same thing. Whatever he's preaching about at that moment, I need to adjust it. 
I don't pray enough. The pastor is talking about praying. You don't pray enough. Your devotion time is too short. You have time for everything else. Put that stupid phone down and spend some time with the Lord. So as you're spending time with the Lord, the God is listening to you and he's talking to your pastor at the same time. And then when you come to the service, when you come into the congregation, you need to come with expectancy that God will talk to you. When you're singing the songs, that's what you're singing to God to get him to come into that room. You're getting, you're asking him when you're singing and praising God, you're asking him to dwell there because that's where he dwells. Where does God dwell? Right in the midst of your praises. And he shows up. He has a, 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 a device, so to speak, one of those meters. And it says, where are they praising me at? Oh, shoot, right here? Okay, that's where I'm going. And he comes right in the midst of that praise. That's where you want him. You need him to go right into your pastor and you need him to talk to me. And when the pastor says do X, Y, Z, that's when you make the decision. That's when you repent. Not later. You deal with it right then. That's what y'all should be doing right now. Lord, the first thing that ever come out of your mouth, you should be praying that God forgive you for whatever the pastor is saying. Lord, we need to give the pastor honor. We need to make sure that we are doing a better job. We're never going to let the pastor cook the food carry the food, come clean the food. We're going to be a part of what the pastor has to do. We're going to be a part of the pastor saving a soul. We have the same desire he has to get the reward that he has. When, it, when a soul is one, we are a part of that. That's my blessing. Forgive me for not doing that. And from now on, I'm going to make a change. Now I'm going to think right now, what am I going to do? What am I going to change right now? So when the pastor is preaching about whatever, I'm trying to think of a good example of something the pastor is preaching about. And you might think it's talking about somebody else. You might think that's for the next person. It might be for you tomorrow. The pastor might be preaching about angry spirit. No, I'm good. And then somebody cuts you off tomorrow and you want to give them the finger. So as the pastor, you don't, you don't, you didn't do it yet. Pastor's preaching, you think he's talking about somebody else. I don't have an angry spirit. People ain't gonna somebody will do something at work. Somebody's gonna do something that'll tick you off. And you need to in your spirit, while the pastor's preaching about angry spirit, Lord, calm me down. Give me a calm spirit. Forgive me for every time I've ever done anything that was angry and deal with it then while the pastor's preaching. And then tomorrow, you remember, I asked God to forgive me for that. I can't put my finger up. Pastor just talked to me about it. God just sent that message for me yesterday for today. All right. Thank you all for coming. Praise the Lord. I'll see you all next week. We're here on Fridays at 9 p.m. I'm sorry, at 7 p.m. And we're here at Tuesdays also at 7 p.m. CovenantServants.com. Or you can go to covenantservants.onlinechurch.